Search for life and bring home rocks. No, that's not what I used to do as a little boy. Well, actually it is. Uh, it's something that the government is spending several billion dollars to do. Hi, I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle Now. And Bill, as we record this yesterday, uh, NASA launched uh, a Atlas V rocket with what they're calling the Perseverance rover that's on its way for a seven-month journey to Mars. It should reach the Martian surface in a particular crater that they want to examine uh, around the end of February 2021. Nevertheless, the mission is called Mars 2020. And Bill, uh, being a, a NASA and space nut that you are and producer of the four-part uh, series, uh, Apollo 11, what we saw, I just wanted to get your initial reaction to the launch of this mission. Um, this is an interesting uh, period in history in terms of, of Mars. Um, one of the amazing things about being alive uh, during the general span of my life was that for the, and it's unique in history, not not because I was born then, but but for other reasons. Um, up until up until probably the very late sixties, early seventies, all we knew about the planets were the things that we could see through the telescope. Galileo in the I want to say the fourteen hundreds was first to build a reasonably accurate uh, telescope. And uh, since I started working in the Miami Planetarium in 1973, whenever we would do a show about Mars or Jupiter, Saturn, for whatever reason, uh, the images that we would use would be the very best Earth-based telescopic images of the planets. And then as we started to get into the end of the 60s, we started to get uh, Mariner 9 to Mars, which didn't go into orbit and didn't land, certainly, but it flew past Mars enough to show us that it looked a, an awful lot like the moon and that there wasn't much there. And so people of my generation are the only ones in history who had the excitement of watching images develop in front of our own eyes. In other words, if you lived before the space age, you never got to see what the planets really look like. If you lived after this age of discovery, that's all you knew was these incredibly high definition pictures. We're the only ones that actually got to watch it every single decade getting better and better and better. So with that said, it seems to me that we are now in a, in a stage of Martian exploration that is, is really kind of a plateau. Uh, all of this to say that while I'm very happy that the probe is going, and I do think this is an appropriate use of federal funds because there's no other way to do this kind of pure exploration, which leads to big benefits downstream. Uh, I can't say I'm terribly excited about Perseverance only because this plateau that we reached, I would say we reached with the um, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers back in the early 2000s. They were designed for a 90-day lifespan, if I remember correctly, on Mars. Uh, one of them went for, I don't know, six, seven years. The other one for 12 or something. And with those two rovers, we got such excellent pictures of the Martian surface and the ability to travel across the Martian surface that when Curiosity, which is a much more capable rover, uh, landed several years ago now inside a crater, brought back amazing pictures. I, I just wanted to say all of this to say that I'm not entirely sure that Perseverance is going to bring back anything that we haven't already seen. And the history of Martian exploration in my lifetime is there might be water on Mars. We've detected white spots that look like there might be water on Mars. We've detected the possibility of ice on Mars. Now we've seen signs that liquid water, okay, so there's water on Mars. Um, it's time to go. It's time to go and see. Well, the way the timeline works right now, um, this is the, there are a couple of interesting things about this mission, at least from my perspective as a rank amateur. Uh, number mm -hmm. one is this will be the first time a highly that, ranked amateur that yes, <laughs> this will be the first time that we've retrieved rocks uh, from the surface of another uh, planetary body without sending people to do that. And so the idea is that. Uh, somewhere around 2026, another mission is going to go to Mars and pick up the rocks that this one is gathering. And by something like 2031, they expect to be able to bring those rocks back to the planet here. Uh, in addition, as you mentioned, they're searching for water. They've got an uh, excellent camera aboard, of course, but mm -hmm. most of the devices are more highly scientific kind of mass spectrometers and things that are measuring all kinds of things that the average uh, citizen doesn't understand, that, but, but that scientists are really curious about. I did uh, find one interesting thing reading the fact sheet from NASA about this mission is one of the experiments is to see if they can produce oxygen from Martian carbon dioxide, atmospheric carbon dioxide, the idea being that perhaps uh, they could produce future rocket fuel. 
Uh, first of all, as far as the sample return mission 3031, did you say they hope to have samples? 20, back, 2031. Like <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Same same thing. So you live in the future concerned. all the time, don't you? Uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I do. But but they're 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 equivalently different and ridiculous dates for me. I think if the, if NASA proceeds according to plan, uh, some of the rocks that they can bring back in twenty thirty one will be some of the tailings from the excavation that SpaceX used to put its hotel in. Um, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, but w with that said, sample return missions have already happened, obviously, with the moon, needless to say, and, and asteroid sample return missions have already happened and so on. Um, the, the issue about, about water on Mars is important for two reasons. Uh, it's important for the, the reason that if there was life on Mars at some time in the past, there's no question that Mars was once much more habitable than it is now. Liquid water is uh, the, the the rivers, the rivulets and channels of liquid water on Mars are, are virtually beyond contention now. That meant that water was flowing on Mars, which not only meant that it was warm enough for water to flow on Mars, much more importantly, the atmospheric pressure had to be considerably higher or else the water simply just immediately evaporates in, into, into the 1% atmosphere that Mars has, which is almost all carbon dioxide. You've got to wonder to what your... the Martians did to screw up their planet like that. They drove too many SUVs, Scott. Have you not been paying attention to the news? Um, the the much more interesting case, uh, I in my opinion, is is the question of how much water there is on Mars. And I had not heard that it could be done with carbon dioxide. I'm sure it can be. But here's the thing about finding water someplace. The thing about finding water is water is amazing stuff. Uh, not only do we need to drink it, obviously, but if you take water and you have enough electricity, then you can run elect water through the electricity and you get two things that are great. You get hydrogen and you get oxygen because water is H2O. Um, the hydrogen is extremely useful as a highly efficient fuel for rocket engines and the oxygen is is nice as a highly efficient fuel for human beings. And the reason all this, the discovery of this stuff is important can probably best be described by trying to imagine what it would have been like to settle the old west if you had to take all of your food, every bit of food and air and so on with you in the wagon. If you think about it, it simply would not have been possible. If you had to basically have a wagon that was big enough, a Conestoga wagon, let's say, to not only get you there, but to keep you alive while you were there for the entire duration until you could build more wagons or something, simply wouldn't have happened. So the reason that water and, and other resources are important at the destination is multiple. First of all, it means that once you get there, you can stay there. If, if, if there's nothing there that you can use to create new water or new oxygen, you're limited by how much water and oxygen you can take with you on the trip. And this is a cascade effect because if you need to take enough supplies to be able to live there without living off the land, that's the expression we're using, then all of that weight has to be accelerated uh, using a rocket engine and that requires fuel. And then the fuel to accelerate the fuel has to be entered into this equation. It's, it's an enormously, enormously um, important difference when you get down to the bottom. So the short form is, if we are able to find uh, significant uh, sources of water there, then we are almost certainly able to make the oxygen that we would need to stay on Mars and the rocket fuel we would need to be able to come back. And that means we don't have to carry all of this stuff with us, land it on the surface, get it back up into Martian orbit, bring it back again. And that makes the entire trip much, 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 much easier. So there's one more, I think, uh, fascinating aspect to this mission, which has uh, captured the hearts and minds of the people who are following such things. In any case, I'm not sure if the American public is behind this like they were the Apollo mission. In fact, I'm sure they aren't. Uh, but they, one of the experiments on this is a demonstration of something called a Mars helicopter. It's a very small, almost drone-like uh, mm -hmm. helicopter that's going to be able to fly around the surface of Mars, That'd theoretically cool. at least uh, massively increasing the range and speed over which distances uh, can be covered. Uh, what do you think of this idea? I think that's wonderful. And that's the one thing I'm excited about, especially. And it's not just that you can cover more distance with the rover. Uh, this uh, With the vehicle, helicopter, you mean? No, no. You can cover, not, it's not just that you can cover more, difference, more distance with the helicopter than you could with the rover. Um, but there's a much 
bigger advantage to this. And that is that if you were able to get a, a flying drone in Mars, and that's a problem by the way, um, the atmosphere is 1% of Earth, so you've got far less air to move, you get significantly lower gravity, that helps you. But if we were able to get this, uh, this um, helicopter going, and I, know, I see no reason why we wouldn't, then that not only gives us a wider area to look at, it gives us a perspective on Mars that we do not have and have not had yet. We've got orbital perspectives that give us uh, increasingly highly detailed views of the surface. We have surface level cameras on the rover and we've had these for decades now. But the view from uh, 10,000 feet is unique. And I can testify to that as a, as a private pilot uh, here on Earth and as a former lo uh, limo driver in Los Angeles for many years. It wasn't until I flew over Los Angeles that I realized how different the actual layout of the roads was compared to how it feels on the ground. That 10,000 foot view is something we've never had before on any planet. And it's not just a question of covering more range. It gives us a perspective on the surface that I think is gonna be very exciting and gonna be very important for manned exploration when we finally get there. The final thing that struck me about this, Bill, and you kind of hinted at it earlier when you said, you know, when they get there to pick up the rocks, they'll be picking up slag from Elon Musk's uh, hotel construction project. Casino, yeah, his hotel casino. Is the, <laughs> is, is the idea uh, that in order to have such a long view of a, an exploration project like this, it really mitigates against private industry doing it. What's the difference between the, the kind of slow but steady uh, basic science approach that NASA is taking and the approach that Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic or uh, SpaceX are taking? We seem to be, um, at least under the Trump administration, we seem to be evolving into what looks like a, a if you'll pardon the expression, sustainable space program. And, and in this new um, paradigm, uh, both government and business are doing what they do best. The new paradigm is the paradigm we probably should have always had, but it is certainly the paradigm that we had with aviation. If the FAA had existed shortly after the Wright brothers, we would be flying in FAA built airplanes uh, that house 60 people, wooden wings, uh, propellers, and a, a, a a ticket in 2020 from Los Angeles to New York would cost $75,000. And, and that's because that's what governments do. And the Wright NASA, brothers would still be known for bicycle manufacturing. That's that. That's right. They, they, they would have invented the airplane, the government would have taken it over. And then at that point it would have become what the space shuttle program was, which was impressive, but 30 years of us literally, truly, honestly, going in circles that are really essentially no different than the circles that John Glenn went in as he was the first, or, or, or Yuri Gagarin for that matter, as the first uh, man to orbit the earth and the first American to orbit the earth. So there is a role for government in this. And, and in aviation, what we saw was that, that the government moved into areas of pure research that benefited all of industry. And since it benefited all of industry, it was good for the country in, in very great many ways. And, and the agency I'm referring to is NACA, NACA, National Aeronautics Committee, National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, I want to say. It's the predecessor of NASA. But what NACA was, was it was a purely research agency. And all of the airfoils that we use from, from small little Cessnas to giant jets, basically, all of the airfoil designs were developed as a scientific research project through NACA. They're, they're called NACA, NACA foils, it's NACA 014 airfoil. This is, this is a very good balance because in commercial aviation, what we saw was that the government had done some fundamental research that meant that the manufacturers didn't have to do that fundamental research. They could, they could immediately start with the scientific foundation needed. And then you got into the benefits of competition. You've got Douglas Aircraft competing with, uh, with Boeing Aircraft. You've got Northrop, you've got Grumman, you've got North American, all of these companies that existed in the 50s and 60s, uh, all of which were contractors on the Apollo program, by the way. And it's starting to look like now that NASA is no longer the, um, uh, let's just say that NASA has been the, um, the airline and it shouldn't be the airline. NASA, NASA should be the FAA. NASA should not be 
responsible for moving people around in outer space. NASA should be responsible for fundamental research like these, like these missions of exploration because there's no financial incentive for them immediately on the part of private companies. They're not terribly expensive in the grand scheme of things, and they provide enormous commercial benefits downstream. So we're starting to see a world where NASA now is, to my utter astonishment and pleasure, no longer standing astride the entrance to space, not allowing anybody else to get into the game, but now actively helping private companies who then basically carry most of the burden financially through, through private endeavors. And this is a really solid, good combination. And, and I think it's, it's happening, well, I know it's happening right in front of our eyes. So just to sum, uh, summarize, the FAA, does not fly passengers. The FAA makes sure that passenger flying is safe and provides regulations and, and its predecessor had done some research. NASA uh, should, be, should be a pure research organization in terms of things like the probes and should be dealing with just fundamental minimum levels of regulation to make sure that the public remains safe. And beyond that, they should be doing everything they can to let people like Elon Musk and, and, um, and Bezos with um, Blue Origins uh, just to get out of their way and let them do this job the way that uh, private industry can do a job when it's motivated. There is an asteroid out there, one, one of thousands, but one that has had uh, enough study done to indicate that this small chunk of rock, certainly less than a mile across, I would think, has enough platinum in it to be worth $5 trillion, $5,000 billion of platinum in that asteroid. And that is something worth going after in terms of whether or not it's financially worth the risk. For those of you like me who are looking forward to our $50 catalytic converters after we start mining asteroids, uh, you might want to consider becoming a member at BillWhittle.com because this kind of conversation about space and the future is intermixed with analysis of breaking news on a daily basis. More than 40 shows each month funded by the members. You can participate with them in a member written blog in the vigorous comments section under each new post. We invite you to do so by going to BillWhittle.com and clicking that big green become a member button. We'll also provide a link in the description below to Bill's four-part series, Apollo 11, What We Saw. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks for watching. Uh, waiter, uh, this table's a little wobbly. Can I get a wedge of platinum or something just to stick under there so, so that it, uh, it doesn't <laughs> shake around so much? Yeah, thanks. <laughs>